next time on Base Funk. I have hostages. I will give you Claudia if you leave now and don't come back. But I will hold Zoe as an insurance policy. Uh, I have a level 10 sorcerer who doesn't have uh, wild magic. The only smart people she knows left really in town are, from what she hears, Warden Light. So she's probably going to go to see Warden Light. Would you be interested in becoming the avatar of abominations, Theodora? You'd choose me? Your needles, your big like knitting needles that you've never used in combat so far, but he holds them in his hand and they begin to glow with like a dark light, like almost like a black flame kind of envelops them and then slowly subsides until they look normal again. Am I supposed to stab the spine with the needles? That that was the implication, yes. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure. 21, so that's a total of 46 damage. Just you pulling your sword out finishes whatever was going on inside this paladin's body that was keeping him mobile. He should be able to heal, but your radiant sword prevents that. So you, as you pull your sword out, just all of his organs just fall out of his body and he falls dead off the horse. Why are the merciful swords working for Lord Danto? Those decisions are above my pay grade. Galen tells me where to guard the road. I guard the road. Yeah, it knocks him to zero. All right, so if one of them puts his sword through your shoulder and another runs up and hits you with the hilt of the sword in the back of the head. I haven't laid a finger on you with my weapons yet. You're really willing to die to hold on to that sword, lady? <laughs> uh, if you knew what I went through to get this sword, then uh, you, you'd understand why. And they're going to head off towards Agarthen to Galen K. Dune, leader of the Order of the Merciful Sword. I think we need to stop dragging our heels getting this episode started. <laughs> I'm just going to throw something across the room after that one there. Jeez. <laughs> you're, you're not the pudmeister here. You're, you're trying to steal my lack of thunder here. That's terrible. How dare you? How dare you? Oh, goodness gracious. So I think before we start, I just want to say out loud, it's something that I think is implicit, but it never hurts to just be clear about boundaries and expectations uh, as we move into what is pretty clearly the final stretch of this season. Uh, the stakes are going to get higher. It's going to get more dangerous. Bad things are going to happen, um, especially because we haven't really had many villains this season. We've had antagonists, you know, Garrick the Great and so forth, but we're getting into the villain part. Theodora is you know, the thrall of a genocidal god and the Order of the Merciful Sword are basically fascist secret police. So I just wanted everyone to be clear that, like, it's going to get pretty rough from here on out. But no matter what really awful things I say to you in character, you're all still my good, good friends out of character. So please don't hold it against me when I'm just very, very mean to you. When I'm Even me? <laughs> Chris, you're my very good friend, but I'm going... Aww. Please don't make me cry. I mean, you show up to recording every week already crying. Sorry to call you out, but it's it's fine. Like you've, I've already cried like during goodness knows how many of these recordings. You know that 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 Oscar-winning performance was just no. I was just having a bit of a weepy day, so it's 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 fine if we all cry. We're all friends. That's good. I just wanted to get that on tape because the vampire murderers currently have you captive and they're taking you uh down the highway no wait wait no, no wait wait no. are these murderers who happen to be vampires or are they people who murder vampires i mean that's just an ambiguous term there mister <laughs> uh, you fall off the horse roll <laughs> <laughs> the dm begins his horrible misery <laughs> all right so i'm gonna do a little bit of narration here uh some intro narration because we got to set this up because the hyacinth highway that takes roland and veltari to agarthen goes on for a bit and so the sun sets and you guys are riding through the night and in the distance veltari you can see the barrier of ilium just reaching up into infinity but because of the curve of the earth you actually see less and less of it as you uh, ride away from it you haven't really lived without it around you in like months. So it's kind of weird to just be like, oh, it's over there and I'm out here. And I think that's like a feeling I want you to have like going into the scene is just 
kind of disorientation at everything that's happened. Mm-hmm. I think I think last episode, uh, via design or just poor luck on, on my part as a player, <laughs> I think I was definitely having a bit of that, of just like, oh, month for months my character was in a very isolated bubble, and now suddenly there's a whole world. Oh no, who is Feltari now? Take that, flat funkers. <laughs> we can chalk it up to the you know the effect of people who have been incarcerated and they're released and they don't know how to act in non institutionalized spaces. I just want to go back into 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 bubble prison now. Like I, I don't know how to live on the outside. You didn't make bad combat decisions. You were doing a metaphor. Exactly. <laughs> it's, my, my character didn't know how to react and was frozen with indecision due to being outside of the prison system. <laughs> All right, so they take you guys down the highway. There's three living vampire paladins, well, undead vampire pal- paladins. Uh, and in the distance, Veltari, you can see the kingdom of Agarthin before you. You've been here before. The guards outside the gates wave the paladins in. They are essentially unchallenged at every point along this route. Nobody messes with them ever, basically. Roland is still unconscious, but um, he is not in danger of bleeding out or anything. They let you keep your sword and they let you make sure he wasn't dead or dying. But as they take you deeper into uh, Agarthen, you notice the neighborhood you're in and it's very familiar. How familiar are we talking? (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad you asked. (laughs) You have zero doubts that they are taking you to the Ninsen Chapel. There's not really any other place they could take us, is there? It's the only location in this kingdom that we've ever talked about, so <laughs> <laughs> might as well. Also, it's their home base, and it's the place where you have did some bad murders, as we've talked about previously. So, As far as they're concerned, they did some very good murders there. Yeah, they're... They're, I'm not sure, both they and Austin are not sure if they believe you that you work for Danto, but it's not worth <laughs> Danto's wrath if it's true. So they're just like, we'll figure this out later. We outnumber you gravely, so whatever. Um, as you guys approach the chapel, you actually go not through the front where people come in to like pray and stuff, but through the back where there is a, a huge cemetery uh, where instead of gravestones, there are just the enormous broadswords that the order uses just driven into the ground in orderly rows where they bury their dead and it's just like this haunting scene of three vampires on horseback trotting through rows and rows and rows of gravestone swords as you and roland are kind of brought in as prisoners they stop and take their dead friend off the horse and they place him down and they're gonna bury him but right now they get you inside the chapel where the uh the paladins immediately start yelling at the prisoners and they're like, everybody get out, go get the, go get the cleric. We got to get these prisoners downstairs. Everybody out there. <laughs> one of them is carrying Roland, but you are still ambulatory and you can talk Veltari if you want anything to do anything in the scene. Nah, for now, I'm just going to watch this play out. I'm, I'm not playing my cards quite yet. Yeah, that's good because they are very testy right now. And so you behaving is a good change of pace for them. <laughs> I just want to have like a slightly smug look on my face of like, yeah, I'm letting this happen. It's it's cool. Yeah, <laughs> that's a very Veltari play. <laughs> uh, they lead you to the back of the chapel as everyone like runs out. And there's a door in the back, which has a big, heavy metal lock on it, um, which keeps whatever is downstairs from getting up. Uh, they unlock that and they open it. And one of them carries down Roland downstairs and the other gestures to you to go downstairs but then the other one stops and says hey can i see that sword sword lady the sword that's so important to you can i see it ah uh, why'd you need to see the sword i just want to show you something this is a dangerous game to play this is not the first time someone's asked to see a sword while my hands are tied you see <laughs> <laughs> he, he unties your hands he just wants to show you something if he wanted to take it they could now, the hands untied. There you go. You did something for me. Have a look. There you go. Should, what, what do you want to show me on the sword? If it makes you feel any better, you flailed around during that whole fight trying to stab us and you didn't succeed, but I just want you to know. <laughs> and then he reaches out and impales his own hand on your sword <laughs> and then pulls it off and then shows you as the wound closes up. He says, you could have stabbed us until the sun rose and you wouldn't have done a damn thing to us. You know that, right? <laughs> I could have. I could have stabbed you, but you, where, where, where would the fun of that have been? 
I'm trying to even think how he contains the knowledge of you in his brain because you're so anomalous. They're used to being feared, right? They're basically, the way I've characterized these three paladins is they're kind of just like frat bros yeah. who heard that you you could sign up to get immortality and unlimited power and a, basically a, a badge to harass people. And they were like, hell yeah, let's do that. And then they were you just- You don't do to do that. Come on, sign up at the nearby station to get paid to slay people and drink their blood. It's the best deal you've ever had in your own life. I, I feel like Veltari's at least got that much of a read on them, and her her tactic for dealing with them is just, as long as you don't seem scared, they're probably not going to know what to do with you. It doesn't have to make sense. You just have to be like, nah, I, I don't care. <laughs> just pay it, play it very straight. You just, you just don't care. He just shrugs and just gestures for you to go downstairs. And uh, the one that carried Roland downstairs comes up past you. And it seems like they're just locking you and Roland in the basement. One, one of them says, like, I'm going to go get Galen. Uh, the cleric should be here soon. You guys guard the door. And then they lock you in the basement. <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff going on in this basement as well. It's not just a dark room with nothing in it. There's, there's a reason there's a lock on the door, you find, as you descend down there. And what you see is... There are rows and rows of beds Mm -mm. down here in the basement filled with people who appear to be mostly unconscious or in some sort of stupor. It's kind of like a hospital situation. Like if you've ever seen like pictures of like the American Civil War, right? It's just like a ramshackle makeshift operation of people getting medical procedures. Roland has added to one of these beds and there appears to be one standing person down here, uh, an elderly, appears to be elven woman. Uh, she has pointed ears. She's wearing kind of like nun's habits. She doesn't seem to be a paladin or a cleric in D&D terms. She just seems to work here mm. as a civilian. And she's going over to Roland to check on his wounds because he had a blade stuck through his shoulder. And she says, Deary, uh, can you hand me the, those herbs? Uh, I don't think he's going to lose the arm, but uh, you can never be too careful. It'd be a good thing if he didn't lose the arm. Uh, he, he's, he's done some good stuff with that arm. You know, it's, it's, you know it's, it's, it's not a bad arm. It's, it's, it's one of the good ones. That's probably more information than I need. Uh, uh, off, like, in a different shot, Roland is, like, looking to the camera. It's like, I, I, I should have never taught her this type of wordplay. Then again, to be fair, her wordplay was already pretty terrible before I saw her. So this is to be expected. I deserve this. You guys are bad influences on each other. I deserved every minute of this. So as you hand the, the elderly, I'm just going to call her the elf nun until you know her name. You hand her some herbs and stuff so she gets working on Roland's wounds. You look around this hmm. basement hospital situation they have going on. And it doesn't take much brain power to figure out that all of these people are being methodically and slowly drained of their blood. Basically like cows at a dairy plant. They're not. They're not being killed. They're just blood factories. Yeah, I get. I get the picture. I'm picturing your sort of um, blood bags in in Fury Road sort of situation. Oh damn! I wish that was a deliberate callback. I fucking love that movie. <laughs> it's a very good film. It's amazing. Yeah, I was thinking of that mushroom episode of Hannibal. With the- <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, that's gross too. Uh, I'm I'm glad you guys are all. You all have such good taste. Um, but, uh, Roland, after you get sufficiently herbed up, um, you can regain consciousness. You're still at zero HP, so you can't start doing cool flips and stuff yet. You can't parkour out of here, but you're awake if you want to talk to Veltaria or the elf nun. Do I recognize the elf when I open my eyes? Uh, nope. This old lady seems like a total stranger to you. Uh, th- thank you for, thank you for helping my friend. Um, I, di- I didn't catch your name. Oh, you can call me Iris. Iris, uh, n- nice to meet you. Uh, quite a place you found yourself in. <laughs> yeah, I heard they needed help. I I used to work in a small village, and when they got new management, a lot of positions opened up. <laughs> a lot of opportunities here. She, you can't tell if she's being serious. She's kind of deadpanning the fact that she works in a blood factory. I, I, I find that really endearing, and as <laughs> such, I'm like, Iris, you, you are now best character. Here we go. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> Roland's going to glance around enough to realize where he is, though, and then just sort of, his just sort of tone of voice shifts. It's like, uh, how do we get here? Uh, well, he, here's one reason we got here. I'm not terribly great with the sword. Uh, that, that's how we got here. <laughs> <laughs> 
You couldn't have given me some kind of magic, some kind of magic-based forgiveness trinket, could you? <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh, so, I'm 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 gonna give you like one bit of quiet advice, Roland. Just follow my lead for the time being. I know that that's usually not a a good idea, but I'm gonna take a lead on some stuff that's gonna happen. I need you to have my back with how I deal with this, otherwise this is all going to fall apart, cool? I'm not, I really don't have much choice or say in the matter right now, so... Well, I, I would rather you agree than, you know, go along with it because you had to, but... Regardless, I'm, uh... I'm sorry for what happened back there. I just... You're Roland. It's fine. I, I get it. You, you, <laughs> you're Roland. You, you were never not going to do that. Off camera, Roland's like, that's the first time she said that to me. I still don't have any idea what it means to this day. But <laughs> whatever. I guess that's a verb now. Yeah, you, you, you did Roland. Ira says, um, so you guys pissed off Galen, huh? We, we pissed off some people, but... Ah, Galen's gonna be fine. Ga Galen should hopefully have a bit of an idea of who I am. It's fine. Uh, who are you? <laughs> I I don't know if you'll know me by name. My name is Veltari, and uh, I killed a lot of people here once. No, nope. it's Goblin to me. It's fair. Galen will probably know. I'm hoping Galen will know. I'm putting my hopes on Galen knowing something about who I am. At this point, you guys hear the lock upstairs open again and you hear someone coming down but then the door closes behind them and is relocked so whoever is coming downstairs is locked in with you okay i'm i'm keeping an eye out for whoever it is that's coming down the figure that walks into the basement with veltari roland and iris is well i could describe her but we'll probably have someone who knows better describe her lauren can you help me hey hi it's me what's up who are you my name is Mara. Oh. Whoa. No Whoa. one expected that. Whoa. <laughs> Actually, it's a bit surprising that, like, she happens to be right here, but... I mean, you guys were coming here to save her, so you knew she was here. <laughs> well, we knew she was here, but we didn't expect her to be brought to us. <laughs> yep, when the vampires brought you in, one of them yelled at the people fleeing, go get the cleric. And they they did. Ah, uh, so uh, Lauren, tell us a bit about Mara Sladen. What do we need to know? Uh, so she, um, if you want to do some googling, <laughs> listeners, she looks kind of like uh, I'd say Effie from Fire Emblem. Mm. It's just it's just a lady, but with giant like armor. Mm. I've revealed on our roll twenty the current situation. There's three vampire paladins guarding you guys, and the situation is Roland, Veltari, Iris, and Mara. So I've used Effie because me and Lauren talked about this. And I've also used a Magic the Gathering character for Iris. So, <laughs> Do you know how hard it is for me every time you say something like this is the situation not to go? Your parents went away for a week's vacation. I didn't realize that was a struggle for you. I apologize. So she's a cleric. Um, uh, basically, the way I've worked it out is she's been kind of working undercover a little bit. Like they keep trying to get her... To turn into a vampire, and she's like, oh no, I have too much to do. Sorry, guys, can't vampire right now. Bye. <laughs> yeah. I when I when me and Lauren planned a little bit before the recording, I usually try to keep off mic chat to a minimum, but I knew she was gonna play, so we talked a little bit, and my basic idea was that she was out on missionary work when the order got taken over, and so she didn't get turned immediately, and she has since been finding every excuse to put it off since she's been back. But if Roland and Veltari had taken too long getting here, they would have arrived to find her undead. But they they hustled. They didn't stop for anything. They made their way. And so they were in time. And she has, she is still human. I have a feeling that Mara might see Roland before Roland sees Mara because Roland's still kind of on the bed and in a bit of pain. Uh, so uh, Mara's going to walk in the door, see Roland and go, ah, fuck. <laughs> hey 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 i know i look a little scary but i'm not that bad oh thank goodness oh who are you the tiefling is with me mara that's fine i don't care what did you do uh what is this i i, I okay i i can explain i 
came across some of what must have been Galen's men after they had attacked a merchant, and I I kind of jumped the gun a little bit there. He did a rolling. Yeah, he sure did. He does it all the time, am I right? Oh, yeah, you're telling me. Thank goodness I met someone else that understands what he's like. Ugh. Does he does he still uh, use a lot of puns? Oh yeah, no, he's a terrible influence. I do a lot of puns, but I blame that on him. He's he's implanted them into my brain. I think it's okay. We'll cure you of that. If if you know a spell that will cure me of puns, just point me in that direction and then quarantine me from him. <laughs> Iris says, "I actually have a cure for puns. It's right here. It's called Hemlock." So. Uh, he, here's the thing, they actually kind of like the puns, but I, it's somehow different when he does them, okay? It's, it's a joke. Hemlock is poison. I was about to say, isn't Hemlock poison? Roller for the Bev's like, that's the joke. That's, <laughs> it's pretty obvious once you think about it for more than a microsecond. I didn't want to, I didn't want to encourage jokes because then Roland will do them and then I'll do them. Ugh. Iris says, we could do with some levity, y'all about to die. <laughs> Iris. It's uh. good to hear you, Mara. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, Mara. Your friends, have, I guess, murdered one of the the order? Oh, God. W- was it you, Roland? Yeah, it was him. It was him. <sighs> he just couldn't resist. You're so big. How ca- I, can- I don't have anywhere to hide you. <laughs> <laughs> uh <laughs> Iris says, I diagnose you with terminal bigness. <laughs> Good one, Iris. I, I, had, I, heard from, I heard from Water that things had changed. I just didn't realize they were this far off from what the order stood for. Oh, it's like it's a whole blood economy, literally. Uh, Mara, it's kind of weird he said he heard from Warder because, you know, Danto killed Warder. Oh, I do know that. <laughs> you definitely know that's a thing that happened while you were gone. So that set that sentence is weird to you. Okay. So yeah, blood economy, but what about Warder? He was kind of like dead. He was dead. Something possessed his body, brought it over to the village that I was staying in, or trapped in, rather. Possessed? Do, do you know by what? That's... Not precisely, though we know loosely where they are coming from, which is around here, incidentally. Cool. Well, maybe now that there's like three of us, we can do some good. I don't know. I'm just one person. It's very hard. All they want to do is go, Mara, are you a vampire yet? Oh, no, you're not. Let's do it. <laughs> like, as, as soon as he mentioned that you were, he said in trouble, but I had a feeling that it was something a little bit more complex than that. I'm smart. Yes. Yes, you are. So... Hey, I'm Voltari. Nice to meet ya. Wait, were you the murdery one? Yeah, the murdery one is me. You know, hands hands up, I, I'm the murdery one. Jeez. Yeah. And Roland, like, converted you? Um, as, <laughs> uh, well, there, there, are, there are many guards around right now, and as such, no, I am still very much who I was before. Murder is fun, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Murder is fun, y'all. <laughs> is that the new message they have at the beginning of the uh, Dice Funk arcade game? As the FBI logo that says, Murder is fun, y'all. <laughs> Winners do murder. Ira says, so you guys are all going to die pretty soon. Do you, do you guys want to smoke this basement out or what? <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Like, I, I have no intention of dying down here. Like... <laughs> I am happy to to sit around and wait until uh, people come that recognize who I am and we can get this sorted out. And if that's not how this pans out, then, you know, look at me. I'm a badass. I'll get us out of here. It'll be fine. <laughs> I got you, sis. I can, I can talk to Galen. Uh, see what I can do. Appreciate it. Just, just emphasize, just emphasize just how many people I just brutally murdered. Like that's that's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good starting point for my cred. Uh, how many was that again? What was that number roughly? Um, the number was roughly all of them. 
Okay. Just, like, let's make up a number like 11,000, you know, you know, just like <laughs> big fake numbers is all we need here. How, how, how many people were there? Take away like two for like people that were on holiday at the time and the number you're left with, that's how many I killed. I mean, that's literally what happened with Mara. You probably would have killed her if she had been in the country. Yeah. Yeah. Roland just sort of like lifts a hand and rubs his face a bit like, uh, I will just stay here and recover then. Yeah. Maybe don't jump into battles, you know, willy nilly. I can't really move from where I am right now. It's almost like I'm at zero hit points still. <laughs> almost. <laughs> you definitely can start rolling hit dice in the meantime to get at least on your feet. Mm -hmm. um, but while you guys are all getting acquainted in the basement where you are currently locked awaiting Galen Kadoon, uh, let's cut over to Claire Elise Legrand, who wants to go to the Sacrum to talk to Warden Light. So, Chris, I haven't heard your voice in a while. How are you? I'm recognizing that I am worried that I'm essentially Willie Loman from Death of a Salesman and that every moment I'm <laughs> contemplating whether or not I'm liked or well-liked. <laughs> In character or out of character? Uh, it, it's mostly out of character. Aww. I try to keep them separate, yeah. In character, Claire knows she's the shit. Okay, that's good. That's the important thing, is that your character that's fake has confidence. Yes. Um, who are you bringing with you to the Sacrum? I assume Winifred wants to go and the rocks could be persuaded. Carrie, not probably. Wolf doesn't want to go in. He's too big. Inside the Sacrum, I would imagine it would probably be, uh, I mean, I wasn't even considering Winifred, but if he wants to pop in, I assumed he'd be like, no, I'm going to stay back here and make jam or something like that. Yeah, he'll make jam. Okay, cool. Uh, but he can come along inside and make jam. I don't know if he could do that mobily or not. <laughs> Um, he does have so many hands, so many, <laughs> so many awesome little tentacle hands that sometimes have socks on them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then probably, yeah, the, the rocks, I imagine she'd be more than fine with coming along. Okie dokie. So you take Winifred and the rocks over to the sacrum. The only thing you notice during the commute is that Ishmael blood mountain, the stone giant is sitting outside the tower, like in front of it, mm -hmm. uh, smoking and he's playing fetch. With, the, with his dog and the salamander sheath, he throws it and the dog brings it back. The cat's sleeping in the grass and he's just kind of guarding the outside of the tower. I don't know because I wasn't there for all of Claire's time. Has she met uh, Ishmael before? It's up to you. Let's play it. All right. Well, I'm going to, as I'm going to walk by, I'm gonna, she's going to give him the, the solemn, cool head nod bob that they do together. <laughs> you know, they don't have a very deep relationship, but, you know, it's a lot of it is unspoken. And that's where a lot of the layers are. <laughs> Ishmael kind of squints at you and goes, uh, which one? Which one? I'm Claire. Nice. Zoe doesn't do the cool head bob with you, does she? No, I'm just. If she does, we need to do something different then. Something cooler. <laughs> it's not you. It's not you, dog. I'm. Hold on. Wait. Actually, I realize this is not the time for that because her life's actually in danger right now. So I'm actually going to get going. <laughs> but afterwards, we're going to return to this. Okay. Have fun. Uh, I'm going to try. Again, my sister's <laughs> life's in danger. Okay. Bring me back a Cinnabon. From where? Bye. <laughs> He's so high. <laughs> uh he lets you guys into the tower um at actually warden light is already in the chapel area he's like picking up a shrapnel of the smashed uh furniture in here someone break furniture in there yeah he when he had his meltdown oh okay this is a while back he's 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 okay he's All just right. picking yeah just little bits of it that like uh, rolled under the pew and stuff uh so when claire comes in and sees him she's just going to shout uh, I, I'm assuming you're more than like, cause you're an angel, dude. <laughs> Sister Legrand, uh, have you acquired amnesia since we last met? Uh, I think you're thinking of somebody else. I'm the other, the, the clone. Oh, of course. How rude of me. Yeah. The shard of jealousy. I'm not really sure what I am. This should be existential, but yeah, I don't have time for that. I got a sister to be better than it. Also, I have to save my sister cause her life's in danger. Uh, okay. So I assume you just explain the whole situation to light. <laughs> Yes. Okay, because there's a lot. We have a lot of stuff going on. And you're here because you didn't have a plan. Yes. As you so often say, the Legrand siblings are not planners. Nope. But you know Warden Light is smart, and so he has a plan for you. Okay. Which I will now reveal on the roll 20. 
Oh. <laughs> Sister Legrand, it's a three-pronged assault on Hawthorne House. <laughs> Prong one. Wolf the troll takes his worm and assaults the far end of the house to draw out the skeletons. They're autonomous, so they won't know any better. They can't use tactics. They'll all go to Wolf. That takes them out of the fight. Wolf can handle himself. Now, you need two teams. One to extract your sister and one to confront and hopefully arrest Theodora and Asriel. I know someone. I have someone I can... Lend isn't the right word. I'm not going to let you borrow this person. I have someone I can recommend for this operation who has the power of flight, who will no doubt be very useful in going in through the hole in the roof and securing your sister. I assume one of the rocks will want to go and accompany them. Meanwhile, uh, the third prong is the remaining rock and you who just walk in through the front, which will no longer be guarded by skeletons, and you take on Azrael and Theodora directly. Um, ideally, of course, bring them back here for rehabilitation. But as I so often say these days, eventually everyone dies, and we all need to make peace with that if it is not possible to bring them in alive. Hmm. I mean, this seems like the good plan. I am very smart. It's a good plan. <laughs> And I guess I would be getting to do something cool by having a fight. Not just a fight, a three-pronged assault. <laughs> well, no, I mean, me specifically, I'm involved in the fighting portion directly of it. Like, the cool one-on-one -on -one sort of fights, you know? Yeah. Like, if this were a manga, there'd be, like, a little visual where both sides are looking at each other. Maybe, like, a little versus shows up between us in, like, some of the panels. <laughs> <laughs> he says uh i would like it very much if you were able to enact justice where i cannot as i'm sure you're aware i cannot risk leaving the tower unprotected so i would not be able to accompany you but i trust you and your allies would be more than sufficient i f i feel responsible somewhat for not reaching sister theodora and in a way letting brother Azrael out of my care although Criminality is a complicated web of socioeconomic factors, and the fact that he was able to achieve some progress within the mirror is not necessarily related to his problems, as it were. So I realize some of that guilt is uh, irrational, but nonetheless, I would very much like it if you enacted my very sweet battle plan. Yeah, that that, that I can do. Um, uh, query, though. What is your quote unquote justice per se? Just so I get it right. Like, I feel like messing up an angel's justice is a bad thing. <laughs> Ideally, in a perfect, beautiful world, Theodora and Azrael could be brought here and rehabilitated and then reintroduced to the population, having overcome whatever difficulties and trauma put them on the path they are on now. However, it's Life is not perfect and beautiful, and sometimes bad people must be dealt with permanently, as Zoe and her group did with the vigilante not too long ago. Garrick, I believe? It's, it's not ideal, but sometimes violence, well, we angels have our holy wars. Got it. All right. And the rocks were with us, right? So I don't need to, like, explain the plans to them. Correct. The plan will be explained to okay. who, needs, who needs it, so you don't have to worry about that. And has she met the uh, the the friend of his that he's he's giving he's letting us borrow? No, not yet. But Martis Valaman, the friend who can fly, will join you when you are ready. Okay. Uh, so Claire's going to say, uh, "Well, I guess if that's everything we need, then we should go and and do it." And she's going to turn to Winifred, just be like, "Is that like a good enough of a plan to go in with then?" I don't know a lot about fighting, but if you cannot hurt Dora, I just think, uh, I think she, she, they're still good. She's still good in some way, and she's lived with us, and she was our friend. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, I'll see what I can do. But like the squid dude, I can get like some super cool, awesome like spell moves off with. I, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know her. <laughs> I don't know him. That's cool though. He, I think he's a murderer. If I remember from our Garrick investigation, so... All right, then I think we have everything we need, and we should head over there to save my sister and to stop all this evil stuff from happening, right? And she's like, do we do we like put our hands in, do like a cool team move? I feel like we should. 
Okay, what do we say on three? Um, this is a big responsibility, Chris. I know. <laughs> I'm I'm tempted. What reference do I want to make with this? Jeebus. Let's fucking kill them. <laughs> Light pulls his hand out when you say that. <laughs> All right, hold on. Let me let me take that back. Let me walk that one back. Uh, let's go team us. That's not good. <laughs> See, the, let's fucking kill them had a lot of oomph to it. You really aren't a good planner, are you, Claire? I got it. I got a new one. All right, everybody in. Mm -hmm. Everybody's in. Cash rules everything around us. Cream, get the dollar dollar bill, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> they love that one. They go wild for it. Sweet. Um, wait, you... <laughs> <laughs> I like the like wait a minute <laughs> you don't know ZZ Top <laughs> I just feel like they've penetrated mainstream culture maybe more than Wu-Tang but I don't know where you grew up yeah uh, east coast and then no they haven't okay fine it's fine um <laughs> so you're gonna mar marshal your forces and the next time we cut back to you we're gonna have a huge rolling boss fight throughout Dora's house Yay! I hope you're insured. <laughs> no, her house is toast. Yeah, no, my house is doomed. I will get you for that. Speaking of Theodora, uh, you are walking over to the sacrum. You have your needles that Gondor blessed. Um, you are making your way over carefully, and in the distance you spot Claire Elise Legrand and her posse leave the tower, and you see outside Ishmael Blood Mountain just getting absolutely lacquered he is destroyed but the dog is sniffing around and the cat is half awake you know how cats do so i think i'm going to go ahead and cast gaseous form all right so my intuition is that you're going to try to float past him however i do want to emphasize that he is in a cloud of pot smoke and you trying to move through it will be very obvious also, that's, that bleak dog, you know, it's got some pretty nice senses, yo. Yep, he's a sniffing and a, a scrounging. Oh, boy. I had another... <laughs> Not the most highly trained guard to, uh, to ever protect a stronghold in D&D, &D, but a weirdly efficient one for Dora's skill set, weirdly enough. Also, I, I believe this is one of those situations where we have to talk about the science of contact highs and secondhand smoke highs and... uh for this next uh, after-school special, kids, we're going to waste way too much time talking about the science of this, or we can just, you know, hand-wave it away. Actually, if someone ever, like, no one really had a heart-to-heart -heart with Ishmael, but he actually does have, like, a whole backstory and stuff, and about Aww. the way stone giants have difficulty uh, psychologically being above ground. This is, like, actual D&D &D stuff, is that they're, they, they live underground, and he, like, smokes weed to deal with having to live on the surface it's like a whole thing that i actually did have plans for and no one really got close to him so it's fine but the the the, the this is frowned upon by all the all the competitive sports that giants uh play in but they never want to address the fundamental issue um <laughs> for the stone giants and it's, it's really unfair <laughs> yeah what if we just turn this into a podcast about the nfl players association right now Shh. what what are you what are you insinuating here that's that's ridiculous Oh, okay. Uh, I'm very, uh... <laughs> mm -hmm. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a little snaking, right? Sneak up. As I do, I'm small. Um, and once I'm within 60 feet, mm -hmm. I'm going to try to cast a Phantasmal Force. Wonderful. I don't think you've used this one yet, huh? I have not. And so what I'm going to project into his mind is me, but like far away doing mischief like coming up so he'll see like me like walking towards him and he'll be like oh it's her apprehend her like run towards me hopefully all right so i need to make an intelligence check yes to detect that it's an illusion he has disadvantage because he's stoned and my spell save dc is 18 botch <laughs> ah! <laughs> you lucky little fish um oh. yeah so that's that's a botch that's the worst it could possibly be for him in his attempt to guard the tower so not only does he run after the phantasmal image of you but he scoops up the dog and cat and brings them with and he like he's running off to get you he, he's gonna save the day he's gonna take you down right now all right uh so then 
I don't know where Warden Light is in relation to... Actually, can I sense any heartbeats real close once I get up to the sacrum? There are only two heartbeats in the tower. You can pretty easily assume Grace, Rosemary, and Warden Light. Uh, Mardis has, has just flown off. Okay. I don't know how good my heartbeat detector is. Can I tell if they're like up in their house or if they're down in the lobby? Uh, they're up in the house part. You sent a message to Grace an hour ago, mm-hmm. so you assume she is working towards your inter- interest right now. Okay. You don't you don't have mashed potato senses, but I'm not gonna risk it. I'm gonna I was gonna just walk in and then cast gaseous form if I needed to, but mm-hmm. that sounds like a bad idea. So I'm gonna cast gaseous form and I'm gonna float under the door. Mm-hmm. And I'm gonna float to the other door. How <laughs> those chains, what those chains do. Uh, the chains don't attack you on sight like they probably should because Warden Light enchanted them, but Grace has, per your arrangement, shut them off. Lovely. So I'm just going to float on through, mm-hmm. and I'm going to, you know, go to the spine. All right. You stand before the giant blue glowing column inscribed with dozens of holy symbols all along its length. It goes from the top to the bottom of the tower. Uh, it's just this massive support column. And here's something uh, which I think Lauren may have thought of at some point, but I don't think Dora has just because of the character Dora is. Yeah. In this stairwell, surrounded by mirror after mirror after mirror, rows and rows of them for 10 stories up, you probably finally come to the realization that if you destroy the spine and the tower collapses because it was supporting it, you will be probably smashing all of these mirrors. And to your knowledge, the only way to leave the mirror is to undergo therapy. Smashing them, as far as you know, you have no reason to think any other way, will be trapping those people permanently inside of that enchantment. In a sense, you will have to commit mass, mass, mass murder if you want to go through with this. Yes. (laughs) Okay. Understood. I I really like Theodora as the villain here because we've lived with her for so long that it take, puts everything in a different light. Like her just not flinching when she killed Garrick, her being willing to sacrifice a friend, even though it was the crabs. She probably would have gone through with that. Like every kind of comically dark thing she did is now like, oh, she was capable of anything the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, please don't hate me, fans. <laughs> um, all right, so you're standing before the spine. It's just this absolutely overwhelmingly powerful mystical support beam for this tower. And all around you are mirrors, and there's the spiral stained glass staircase. Uh, Dora's going to take a deep breath. Get out all her uh, her blessed, her blessed needles. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's gonna drive them into the spine as hard as she can. You plunge them in as if you were stabbing a person, like they just go in. They don't destroy the spine completely on first impact, but there's a sound like shattering glass, and you see from the point of impact, a darkness begin to creep through the neon blue that the spine is. Uh, like an infection, like a rotting, and as it begins to seep out from the point of impact. So right now there's just two little holes. You just stuck two knitting needles into this thing. You didn't instantly destroy it, but something is happening. It, like Gondador's magic is seeping in and infecting it and is creeping up it, but it's going to take a while. This was not as instant. I don't know if you thought it was going to be instant, but you're standing there looking at them. They're embedded, and now darkness is creeping through it. All right. Uh, if I had time, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd like to write to Gany and be like, what do I do? <laughs> uh, I think you, uh, drop your, you have to drop your bag to like get your book out. And when you do, uh, the whole tower shudders like turbulence in an airplane and you, all the mirrors rattle on the walls and upstairs you feel one of the heartbeats moving towards the door. All right. I grab my bag and I book it. Oh, okay. Now I want. Well, maybe not. Okay, no. Well, I want to be clear because uh, I'm not interested in tricking you. I'm not interested in like a gotcha. I want you to make decisions with the knowledge that make them interesting. These needles are embedded in the spine and they're doing something to it, but it's gonna take a while. But what it's doing can be stopped. So if you book it, if you leave, there's nothing preventing light from walking down the stairs and pulling them out. <laughs> and then he has the needles. Okay, because I'm like out of spells. Oops. 
I only have two spell slots. Yeah, warlocks, huh? Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of other things. I don't know. Uh... Mm-hmm. Actually, I'll use message. Um, I'm going to send a message to Grace. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tell her, I'm working on it. I think your dad's coming to investigate. Distract him. Yeah, you hear yelling upstairs when you send that message. And you're just like, I'm sure it's nothing, Dad. Come on, we got to finish this. Ta- <laughs> yeah, we have to finish these mashed potatoes. They're really good. I worked all day on them. And he's like, Grace, this tower is made out of materials forged by gods. It doesn't shake. It doesn't shudder. It is nearly invincible. I'm just going to take a peek. Make her start crying. And Warden Light says, has it really come to this, Sister Theodora? You're a fascist dictator! (laughs) (laughs) All right, here's what's going to happen is Warden Light is going to attempt to kill you. Yeah. Mathematically, Lauren, this is Austin to Lauren, there is no statistical universe in which you can win this fight. Oh, no, not at all. No, this he was a potential final boss for the whole party if you all were anti-tower. Solo, um, it's a one in a million that you could even get close, but maybe you can hold out long enough for the needles to finish the job. I don't have a lot of hit points, so I can hope. <laughs> it doesn't look good, homie. Roll initiative. Da, 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 da. Roll to five. <laughs> good start. 20. Lovely. Light goes first. I'm gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> so for the first thing, uh, Warden Light, as he walks down the stairs, and I want you to imagine this like beautiful spiraling rainbow staircase that's like cross between Kingdom of Hearts and Revolutionary Girl Utena, and he's walking down, and you're cowering at the bottom, and he's going to cast Sacred Flame. You need to make a dexterity saving throw. To see if you dodge as he tries to incinerate your ass. Ah! Four! Nah, dog. He drops just golden, radiant flames right on top of you, and you are blasted for 29 damage. Fuck, son. What are you at? That puts me at 16. (laughs) Oh, this is gonna be very bad. (laughs) I I know. All right, so let's cut over to the Ninsen Chapel, um, what are you guys doing? You guys, I'm, all- I'm just hanging out over here, very happy that uh, we're not in a boss fight right now, and definitely aren't going to be in one before the uh, episode ends. Nope, definitely not. I'm the sweatiest woman in show business right now. Okay, so you guys are in the basement of the Ninsen Chapel. Everyone's uh, brought up to speed. Uh, is there anything you guys want to talk about right now? Because uh, it- just as a side note, uh, during the cutaway, um, since we've been here for long enough. Uh, Roland's going to spend some hit die to recover some health. And on top of that, he's been doing them with with a little bit of help from me because for once we're actually using uh, Song of song of Rest. Yes. Uh, so I, I play a little song, or if I don't have my instruments currently, I sing a little song just to help rest. It's all Scandinavian death metal lyrics, so he doesn't <laughs> quite understand what it means. Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, so, like, yeah, so... Roland's recovered a bit of health, but he's still not really moving much because, you know, he's trying to recover up. It's like, okay, well, I'll let you two talk things out with Galen to start, at least. Though I have a feeling once he knows who's here, he's going to be quick to rub it in my face is the best way to describe it. If you can bite your tongue for a while, that's probably going to be beneficial if you can. (laughs) I'm, I only worry that if I bite my tongue for long enough, he might suspect that something's going on, knowing what happened the last time we saw each other. Okay, don't don't bite your tongue off entirely then. Just, you know, bite your tongue an appropriate amount, but, you know. He talks about you a lot. He really hates you. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. <sighs> it's given that I was one of the only people who even questioned his authority. You hear from the ground floor uh, the unmistakable voice of Galen K. Dune. Who has arrived in the chapel. I have read a fiery gospel written burnished rows of steel. As ye deal with contemners with you my grace shall deal. Let the hero born of woman crush the serpent with his heel. Our God is marching on. 
But you hear that above you, and you hear a, a metal clang as if he has dropped his sword blade onto the floor in anticipation, and you hear the door to the basement unlock. <sighs> Iris says, is there any specific way you guys want to be embalmed? I'm still hoping for the Danto. Danto wouldn't like it if you embalmed me full stop approach, but mm-hmm. we'll see. Maybe pretend he's like your trophy or something. You can ask me that question after I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you guys are going to go upstairs? If the door's unlocked for us to go up, sure. Iris stays downstairs. Veltari, Roland Hawklight, and Mara Sladen death march up the stairs to the first floor, uh, where there are three Order of the Merciful Sword Paladins and Galen Kaydun, who I will now add to the roll 20. Uh, they are all fully armored vampire paladins, and they look both furious at you and kind of delighted to how awful this is going to get. (sighs) Galen is, as you described him, a statuesque military figure, the kind of guy they use in propaganda posters about (laughs) strength through faith. Uh, He has his huge two-handed sword uh, with its blade on the floor and his hand on on the bottom of the handle. And he says, Saints alive, Roland Orc lover Hawklight. Quite a sight to behold, isn't he? <laughs> I heard you went and got yourself uh, trapped in the rainbow. Mm-hmm. So how is it you find yourself here, killing my men? To be accurate, it was just one of your men. You just never could help those traitorous instincts. I'm wishing in hindsight I'd kept him on slightly a tighter leash. That's uh, my bad. <laughs> The three paladins kind of walk forward and force Roland to his knees. They've taken, obviously, his sword and shield and armor and stuff right now. But they don't touch Veltari and Mara for now. And this he seems to be making this personal with Roland, naturally. And as the three of them hold him down, Galen walks over and looks down on you and says, So how were you imagining this was going to go? To be fully honest, I was worried that when I... I was going to see you and your men. I thought you were going to be gleaming examples of your idea of justice, you know, spreading through the land, and I'd have to be strong of character in order to rise above it. Seems like the first part of my worries, I don't have to worry about that at all. You've really let yourself go there, Galen. You do so love talking about justice. Here's an idea. We'll play a fun game. I'm going to start cutting off your fingers, one by one. And if Ilmater or Torm or Tyr or any of them come down and tell me that I am enacting injustice, I will stop immediately. I will resign my position. I will let you and your friends go. Uh, 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 Galen, I don't want to, I'm sorry to interject, sir, Um, but she's a, she's really close with Danto, and I think He's like her, like, trophy or prize or something? Uh, you've, you've ruined the fun. I was going to leave him squirming for a minute, but... <laughs> uh, oh, jeez, I'm sorry. I, I was going to I was gonna watch him sweat and squirm about having his fingers cut off, but, um, yeah, like, putting all my cards out on the table, we'd, I, we really shouldn't let him get injured because that's, that's Danto's deal. Um, to make a very long story short... Dante's not going to be best pleased if he if he doesn't get to be the one to toy with this guy. Sorry, I was I was going to watch you, you make him squirm for a bit, but uh, deception. Eleven. Not great. Uh, Galen turns to you and says, "Who are you supposed to be?" My name's Voltari. You know, a bunch of people died here. Mm, that was me. That was my doing. You don't look like a vampire. Uh, I'm not. Me and Donto had a thing going. Like, me me and Donto's deal was just... I did the things that, at the time, people were too squeamish to do for him. He kept a nice roof over my head. I, I did the jobs I was told. He was happy for me to just keep doing what I'm doing. Our friend Roland here killed one of my men. This isn't the first time that I've had cause to thrash the insubordination out of it, and I have to admit... I enjoy it quite a lot. I'm sure you would. I, I'm more than happy to go tell Donto when when I see him. Like, look, 
this is what this guy's done. This is the list of people that want to give him a flogging. I am I am only here having to drag his ass around now because he is responsible for me not being able to bring back someone I promised Donto I'd bring back. So yeah, if if he's if he's pissed you off this much, imagine how much of a thorn he's been in Donto's side. Donto needs him, but who's to say how much of him he needs? You catch? I catch you, but again, like Any pleasure that you get out of messing with this guy is pleasure you're depriving Danto of. Like, every finger you cut off to to teach him a lesson is a finger Danto doesn't get a cut off. Mara here, she's uh, quite a healer, ain't you? Uh, yes, sir. So, theoretically, you could patch him up, right? Just just like new. Never even... Danto would never even know. I think she would tell. (laughs) I don't trust her. Look at her horns. <laughs> okay. Hey, hey, hey. Are you really in a place to be judging? This is, uh, <laughs> I, I thought that by bringing this guy back, I was escaping from Judgment City, but, uh. Um, roll deception, Mara, if you're trying to help with this. Come on, be sneaky and, and conniving. 17. Ooh. Seven. <laughs> what is with all these terrible rolls I'm having? Uh, that's not a seven, Laura. That's a botch. That's, that is a botch. While Galen is kind of giving Veltari the third degree because she botched, he gets a look on his face and he begins to walk towards the stairs to the basement, dragging his sword behind him, letting it like scrape really unpleasantly on the floor as, as a clear intimidation tactic. And he disappears down into the basement for a moment. And you, also, you guys are all just left there, like, awkwardly being <laughs> watching Roland being held down and waiting for him to come back. And then when he does, he is carrying in his arms one of the patients from downstairs. Uh, just a, a nameless civilian who is being drained of blood. And he drops this unconscious person on the floor at Veltari's feet and says, All right, killer. Show me what Danto taught you. What I want to do is cast Precedisitation, which I still can't say that word right, uh, to summon an illusory sword that I basically want to make look as over-the-top, dramatic, evil, dark sword as possible, just to be like, yeah, this fits in with the motif of, of badass tiefling. With my foot touching the person on the floor... I basically want to plunge this illusory sword into them while casting Feign Death. <laughs> okay, first, um, Galen needs to make uh, a perception check to see if he notices the sword is fake, and then I'll need to make another check to see if he sees you casting Feign Death. So this is ballsy and could be very good, but <laughs> there are some things to keep you from just instantly winning this cool thing. So Yeah, right. What's your uh, spell save, DC? Uh, I believe it's 16. Sorry, I'm just trying to pull it up. Yep, 16. 21. Shit. (laughs) So you pull out a cool, dark, illusory sword and you go to plunge it down into the body. And as you do, Galen takes a swing at you with his big, broad sword because he knows you're faking and he effing hates it. (laughs) Oh, he botches. Well, this just went sideways. Ooh, okay. If I might propose something, you want to be, want to do something really, really ridiculous here, Austin? Sure. Those swords have holy elements tied to them, correct? They have holy markings on them because merciful sword stuff, right? Uh, the idea was the sword basically falls out of his hand enough where Roland can basically touch the sword with his knee, use it as a holy symbol, and and turn the unholy on the mooks that are holding him down. Okay. So here's what happens. Veltara, you fake stabbed a civilian. He sees it and goes to chop you. And Roland, you make your move because this botch gives you an opening and you're going to like stand up real quick and try to make enough contact with the sword to uh, u- use it as a holy item and cast a turn undead spell. Yes. All right. So I need to make a wisdom save. Yep. Against 17. Um, so here's Mooks. Uh, 12. They fail. And here's Galen. 16, he fails. Oof. So a blast of holy magic radiates out from you, like a tidal wave. And 
the Ninsen Chapel explodes in violence. <laughs> All right, we're going to cut away from that. You guys keep setting up the coolest shit ever. Woof. I'm glad that turned out okay there. I'm just like, fuck these dice rolls. I keep having cool ideas that I keep fucking up. I was I had <laughs> so many close ways of getting out of things. Where was early season three where I was getting all those amazing dice rolls episode after episode? Right. All right, so... Claire, Elise Legrand, your troops are assembled. Do you have any uh, motivational speeches you want to make? Wolf is ready to roll out. Uh, Mardis Valaman walks up. Uh, Skitch has his character sheet and can control him if he wishes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think what she'll just say is, uh, so everybody knows what they're, they're doing, what part of the super amazing plan that I had definitely help creating uh, and what role you're about to play. And remember, this is our chance to to not only save my sister, but our chance to look super cool and be heroes. Yeah, heroes! Hell yeah! High five. Hero five. Wolf high fives you harder than he should. It probably does one damage. Right, uh, heroes. Uh, sure, sure. You you okay, new guy? Uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it's been a while since I've had to mobilize like this, uh. So, so if I'm if I'm correct, myself and you, Claudia, are gonna go through the roof effectively. We're just gonna grab the elf kid and fly back out, probably. And- That's fine enough. Uh, speaking of which, uh, here, let me do a little something that will help the two of us out. Then, and Martis takes a moment to mutter something softly, and then uh, he's going to touch Claudia's shoulder um, as he casts Long Strider on himself and Claudia. Which basically means that their space speed are now increased by 10 feet for the next hour. Got those Barry Sanders jukes now. Uh, it's, it, this will help us a bit, and it'll also make what I can do a little bit easier. So, I, I guess we are going to wait till your signal, Claire, to move in? Uh, how was it phrased with Warden Light's plan? Was it that we're... I know Wolf's going in to distract the, the skeletons. It would do, I, I know uh, Claire's going in through the front. Is there a signal I need to give? To say go through the top, or is it just like once Wolf starts shit, like that's go time, basically? Yeah, I mean, it's Claire's the leader, so you can say when it goes, but you don't need to overly concern yourself with the minutia. It'll, they'll, everyone will play their part. Okay. So yeah, she'll, she'll basically just explain of, uh, you know, once, once Wolf goes in, starts tearing through those skeletons, that's the sign for the rest of us to go in. And I know that we've been making a lot of jokes about how cool we're all going to look, but <laughs> this is also the time for us to get serious, too. And, uh, that's when uh, you see Claire basically like pulling out uh, a sword, and then with the other hand, uh, like holding Roland's sh- uh, shield, mm-hmm. and uh, she says, "Now's the time for us to look awesome and prove exactly what we're capable of." Heroes, heroes, heroes! <laughs> it's just, <it's> just Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> Mentally, Claire's like that would have been a much better teams like motto to go with with the hands thing yeah remember that for next time okay well we'll be on standby until it's time to move in and well i think we have enough to work with here fortunately if anything looks like it's like getting bad though like get out of the area because there's no reason that anyone else should like (laughs) die or anything like that that would really bum out like the success of this mission oh trust me i have no interest in dying after 50 years Ugh, anyway. That's a weird thing to say. I feel like there's a lot of backstory to you people that I don't know. Uh, I'll find out one day, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm real deep. I have like a, a whole complex and then I want to be here. It's, I'll explain it to you later. It's good. I'm complex. You have layers. I can tell. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are you ready? Yeah. Yep. Hero time. <laughs> Wolf rides off on the worm and he's going to go slam into the back of Dora's house. And now Austin. Important question here. Which Crush 40 song are you playing in your mind as this happens? We did City Escape in season one. So Live and Learn? Is that? Live and Learn sounds more appropriate for this standpoint. Yeah. I mean. (laughs) (laughs) I'm personally, I'm going in with what I'm made of from the Sonic Hero soundtrack, but it's good that we can like kind of connect with each other on where we're at. That's, That's important. I'm trying to remember the name of the band who did uh, Pump the Pumpkin Hill theme because there's an overclocked <laughs> remix of that and I've been just every day is a struggle to not use it on my show. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, even as things are at their spookiest right now, you can't put it in? I swear to God, if you do not put spooky, scary skeletons in here when they're fighting the skeletons, I am never going to talk to you again. That's Wolf's music. When Wolf's fighting the skeletons, it's the... It's basically just a dance party with a giant worm in the middle of it, and that's what's that's playing, so. Okay, so Claire, the rocks, and Martis walk off towards the house, and they do it in, like, slow motion like the Reservoir Dogs. And as they do, and as I will edit in, <laughs> the Pumpkin Hill theme <laughs> from Sonic Adventure 2 <laughs> begins to play. And just imagine them all walking in slow motion. They're all putting on sunglasses as it's going. You can hear her right now. It's probably at this point in the edit, I'm going to make it overwhelm my voice so that I'm still talking, but you can't really make out the individual words because now it's pumping. It's so good. (laughs) Claudia takes your hand, Martis. Yep. And then Martis casts fly. And we're off. Claire is going to cast something as well, since I believe Robin's going along with her. Mm-hmm. Uh, she is going to cast a, a spell, not actually a spell, it's actually a feature, but it's called a Stone Agus, and essentially she's putting a ward on uh, Robin that basically makes it so if someone tries to hurt him, the potential damage he could take is lessened, and she, and she can instantly come to his aid. Nice. So there's like a small shimmer of magic kind of floating around him. All right, and you guys can already see like the debris from the, the worm tearing open the side of Hawthorne House and the skeletons are pouring out and that fight's going on as Claire and Robin uh, walk in the front doors, which are, are in like half repaired from the last fight, and Martis and Claudia land on the roof. Uh, one thing that Team Extraction has as a weird little twist is that Martis can see into the ethereal realm, into the ethereal plane within 30 feet of him. Nice. Which I suspect is very useful in a spoopy house. So you have kind of like Batman Last of Us vision? Yeah, basically like, yeah, it's like he could see in the material plane, he has dark vision and ethereal vision, just sort of like, all right, let's see if we can find out what's going on here. Draws out his rapier, gets a shield brace, then moves down the tree into the room it's shutting up from, right? Yep. So as you guys begin to move down the tree, uh, you can see down into the workshop the kind of lab where a lot of Mm -hmm. spooky science has happened and you see just as promised off screen to your characters um as soon as funny business happened the stalker begins to asphyxiate the unconscious zoe so the worm crashes into the house the stalker which is just a humanoid water monster just moves its body over zoe's and she has like 30 seconds of air before she dies all right. Uh, and that's what you see as you come in through the hole in the roof. Yeah. So, well, yeah. So he's going to, Mars is going to get till within 10 feet. And then he's going to tap into one of his other features from his uh, plane shifter class. He's going to do an ethereal shift where he shifts into the ethereal plane, teleports 10 feet, shifts out of it. And now instead of being aspected to wind, he is aspected into water before he moves to make an attack against the, uh, the stalker itself. (laughs) Martis is very cool. I don't know if you've ever explained his character sheet in depth on the air, but he has a bunch of cool powers. Basically the best way to describe what Martis is. Martis is like a, an arcane type of character known as a plane shifter, where he is attuned to two separate elemental planes, but he can only be in one plane at a given time. So on the way over, he was attuned to the plane of the sky And now he's attuned to the plane of the Maelstrom, which gives him access to water and ice-related antics. All right, what kind of antics do you inflict on the Stalker? Well, he is going to make an attack roll against the Stalker uh, with his rapier. 26? (laughs) Yes! But what Mardis does when he hits is pretty interesting. Uh, He does 8 damage, but he also can push the Stalker 15 feet away as he hits it. Wow. I can't believe how well suited he is for this mission. I know it was Warden Light's very smart plan, but even Austin forgot about that thing. <laughs> While he's aspected in the plane of water, so he's able to push the stalker off of Zoe off of Zoe and then sort of position himself in a way where he's between the stalker and Zoe. So it doesn't look like it actually hurt all that much because it's made out of water. Right. But yeah, you did you push the stalker's body off of Zoe. Mm-hmm. So now you need to make a dexterity saving throw. Uh-huh. As the stalker attempts to asphyxiate you, Mardis. All right. Uh, deck saving throw against what? Uh, 13. A natural 20. A crit on that. Jesus. 29. 
I, I, have, a, I have a fun thing I could pull off here that I, I'm curious if you want to try this out here. Martis can try to use his reaction to do an icy rebuke to try to freeze the stalker. <laughs> it's very rude, but go ahead. Uh, the stalker needs to make a dexterity saving throw against uh, Martis' spell save DC, which is 17. He, is, he successfully avoids it, so th there he will be restrained until the end of their turn and knocked prone. Uh, no, no, on a, uh, he, he's only knocked prone, so he's knocked off of Martis, but he's not restrained as he's not frozen. Yeah, the soccer can't be knocked prone. He's just a water guy, so. Yeah, so, so sort of like shaking him off a little bit there with a little bit of like, as ice sort of like flex off of Martis's body there. Uh, Claudia says, do you, do you want to fight this guy or you just want to get out of here? We have Zoe. We can move whenever you're ready. All right, so let's cut over to Claire Elise. You, got, you and Robin just walk through the smashed front door and in the middle of the parlor, uh, where this campaign began, literally where Claire was born on the spot, is Azriel the Mind Flayer. And he says, I never had a choice. Gondor would not, would not accept my failure. He is too powerful. You are just dooming everybody. Where's the Nixie? She said something about unlimited power. It. She says a lot of weird stuff. Something I don't understand most of it. <laughs> yeah, I can relate. And I'm gonna cast a uh, blindness slash deafness on uh, uh Asriel. <laughs> okay, I have to make a save. Uh, yes, it's a constitution saving throw, a uh, spell save of 17. Oh, that's very high. Oh. Is 8 high enough? <laughs> Is 8 higher than 17? Hold on. Shit, hold on. I gotta take my socks off. I need to use my toes for this, too. <laughs> so he's like, no. <laughs> so he says, like, oh, I, did, I didn't mean to. I was, I was coerced. And you're like, tough titties. <laughs> yeah, tough shit, bitch. You're blind now. Yeah, and he, he like, reaches up to his face because you've blinded him, and he's uh, basically at your mercy. Robin runs over and reaches up to his face, uh, which, as we said before, Robin just looks like an elf man now. He doesn't actually look like he's wearing the domino mask, mo mostly, because it just kind of technologically polymorphed into his face. Mm -hmm. But he reaches up to where the mask would be and grabs at the flesh and pulls it, and it comes off, and he begins to turn back into an ooze. And it becomes clear to you that Robin intends on dissolving Azriel alive in front of you. Claire is going to say, uh, hold on a moment there. <laughs> <laughs> now let's wait up here just a little bit, I say. <laughs> well, she says that, and she says, I know you want to do this because he hurts your wife. But unfortunately, as leader of the Lilies, I need to make sure that he personally gets his just desserts. And Claire's going to walk up as he's blind and just start casting fireball and put it up to like the highest spell slot and just like drop it into him. Okay. From, so Azrael's turn comes and he uses his uh, action to like rub his eyes until they're not blinded anymore. That's what his turn is. And when it becomes your turn again, you drop the fireball on him. I'm going to make a dexterity save. Mm -hmm. Four. Okay, that's hold 10 on. 10d6 fire damage. Uh so Azrael fucking explodes. <laughs> <laughs> uh 29. Wow, that's a lot of really low numbers there. Yeah, honestly, not as bad as it could have been. He is badly scorched. Um, but Robin runs through the flames as he turns back into a slime and he's gonna try to engulf Azrael still. He's not listening to you. Eh, I mean I got I got like my part of the payback in there, so if he wants to take him out, by all means. Robin only does seven acid damage as he hits Azrael with his slimy body, but he's going to get worse every turn. So it's Azrael's turn. He's going to use Mind Blast on Claire. She, need make, she needs to make an intelligent saving throw, DC 15. 13. Mm. That negative one is a pretty big uh, mm. detriment, unfortunately. <laughs> you take 30 damage oh, Okay. as he Mind Blasts you and you are stunned. Oh, okay. It's Robin's turn again. A crit and a botch for my two attacks. Well, the crit's going to be some pretty mean damage there. Okay, so Robin engulfs Azrael, doing 10 damage. Uh, that was with his crit. And then he botches, which is to say Azrael flies up out of him, out of 
Robin's range as he just goops to the floor. And now Robin cannot contribute to this fight because Azrael is flying. Okay. And Azrael's going to fly over to you and try to tentacle your face off. I'm pretty pumped. Let's do it. How's 22? That's a hit. Take 19 damage. Okay. How much health you have left? I have eight. Oh my, this is coming down to the wire. Uh, it is your turn. All right. I cast Polymorph on him, and I'm spending three Sorcerer points to uh, use uh, Heightened Spell, which makes it so when you roll your spell DC against it, you're taking disadvantage to it. Okay, so I have to... You have to roll twice, and you have to hope both of them beat 17. So I have to roll twice, they both have to beat 17. Yep. Yep. 18 and 9. Ooh. Aww. Nice job. We are so close. What do you turn him into? You're a turtle now. Oh, okay. So so you turn Azrael into a turtle. He <laughs> falls out of the air. He's going to take falling damage. He takes 11 damage as he slams into the ground as a turtle. And Robin slides over to him as an ooze and begins disintegrating the turtle. Ah, I, uh, I'm tough. I'm torn between what I want to thematically do and what's going to not just make this episode drag. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we have three cliffhangers already. We have uh, Mardis and Claudia upstairs. We have you and Robin downstairs. We have the everything in the Ninsen Chapel and we have Theodora. So if we could end on four cliffhangers, I would be pretty turgid. Here's what I want to do, and you can tell me if this just sucks or not. Uh-huh. I want Claire to basically pick up the turtle, uh-huh. cast haste on herself, run to the sanctum, and just fucking slam dunk that turtle into a mirror. Just any mirror. Ooh. Okay, so you have eight health left? Yeah, but if it's going to be like Robin's going to fight me on it, like I'm not going to bother doing it. No, you're going to take acid damage if you try to reach into him, and it might take you out. Yeah, um... I mean, I guess it's, uh, you know, you know, you're just so exhausted from it that Claire's uh, not going to be able to do anything. It's just going to have to let it go. I mean, he wants his revenge and she's too tired to really stop him from taking it. Is there really nothing to gain from getting knocked out here, especially when it's obvious that Dora's not here. So you look down as Robin kills Azrael and you consider reaching in to try to save him, but it's ultimately not worth it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Not for nothing, but you're kind of a dick. Uh-huh. Here's my final question of the scene. What would Zoe have done? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too. Uh, I think Zoe probably would have. I mean, she doesn't have polymorph, but that's, I think, the mentality of Zoe there. And maybe that's why Claire would have done that right then. But she's fine with it. People will know that the Lilies enacted justice here for them or uh, enacted revenge, I guess to say. So, OK, so she would be willing to do that. Yeah, I, I think Zoe would, but I think, uh, you know, and, and Claire is a yeah. clone of Zoe, but there are differences that have come between them from basically the ways their lives have gone since then. Yeah. And uh, I think Claire has not had to endure the same level of trauma that Zoe has, and because of that maybe doesn't have the same level of empathy. Important character distinctions. Uh, can I turn him into a millipede instead? Because I feel like seeing a millipede die will be much less sad than a turtle. Yeah. I mean, it could be symbolic because Theodora has the pet turtle. It was the symbol of the avant garde I think dissolving the turtle as the fellowship <laughs> of you guys dissolved is pretty oh, gosh. on the nose. I feel like I need to turn off the Sonic the Hedgehog Crust 40 music now because it doesn't <laughs> feel nearly as heroic and appropriate. <laughs> Well, we still have the other fight upstairs that we'll see next time, probably, so. So finally, Theodora, you are in the stairwell with Warden Light, and he is walking down the stairs towards you. He just blasted you with Sacred Flame. Uh, Grace is up in the top floor. She's looking out the door, and she's panicking because she wants to leave, but she's not going to fight her dad. So she's just looking down at you as this is happening. What do you do? I have a very, very dumb idea. My favorite kind of idea. Dora wants to fly Uh huh. to where he is. Mm-hmm. Point blank, Eldritch ba- blast him in the chest into a mirror. It's very quiet. Did my internet cut out? No, I just... I've had 
like six months of planning and working on this campaign and it just never occurred to me to use them like that and I'm just so dumb. <laughs> this room is covered in weapons. Every single inch of this room is a weapon. Um, The way Eldritch Blast works is you get two. So you get to roll twice. 27 and 18? What do you say? This is for you, Ganny. The first Eldritch Blast hits him in the chest. He is... Blasted back off the stairwell, but his he's in midair because he has wings. When the second hits him, pushes him back, and just a feather of his wings touches the mirror, and he vanishes. I didn't think it would work. Oh, my God. <laughs> and then there is a mighty, thunderous, crashing, exploding noise. As the tower collapses on top of you. You're giving me too many things lately. You're all I need. You smiled at me and said, Don't get As always, I'd like to thank Overclocked Remix for our theme music, including Vampire Spanker, an arrangement of Vampire Killer from Castlevania, Graveyard Theory, an arrangement of Pumpkin Hill from Sonic Adventure 2, and Destiny Forgotten, an arrangement of Simple and Clean from Kingdom Hearts. Executive producers for the month of October 2017 are Kerstin Haslinger, Jade, Extellaris, Joseph Timbrello, The Cult of Gorfnax, Dr. Goatman, Irving Royale, Ken Fursell, Andrew Grothen, Paul Mullen, Levi the Young, Luke Powers, Michael Goodell, Brent, Kevin Dobbins, Anthony Sauvier, Rip Van Winkle, George Soros, Arjun de Koning, Grimlock, John Potts, Dawson Parr, Noah Sudret, Ziphasurus, Elderly Goose, Salad Child, Seraph Stone, Thorsten Gross, Devin Smith, Castor UK, Aki Savalainen, The Paladin's Wife, Florian H., Charm Wilkie, Komano, The Kumenu, Rebecca James, Dominic Bowden, Melissa Nielsen, Don, Eugene T., Connor Reynolds, Pruitt Holcomb, Artemis BJJ, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in Bristol, Francois V., Shyness, Dennis Pancake Detlefsen, Ripter Stormwolf, Miko from Finland, Dennis Bankston, Josh Mosier, Indigo Van Dane, Allison Ansel, Sydney Marzing, Just a Jester, Sevarden Akrasimova, Brady Warner, Kitty Foe, James Neely, Marissa Donaldson, Melanie Joe, Lana Seawolf, Ruby Offer, Matthew Weber, Sarah Hanley, Melissa Booker, Cameron Abbas, Dylan, Gary Sayon, Anna Stuhlfarer, Sean, the host of Funk Dunk Plays, Giorgio Renna, Harrison Andrew, Kevin Sidlow, Christopher Charlow, Jorit, Viger Arnston, Cody Jackson, August Rue, Athos, and Ingmar Gremmen. You can join this list by supporting the show at patreon.com slash austinyorski. You can also find Chris at patreon.com slash weekly manga recap. And you can support Laura by reading her work at kotaku.co.uk. You can support the show indirectly by finding us on places like iTunes, Podbean, and Google Play, and liking, commenting, rating, and subscribing to us. Now that you've made it to the end of these credits, congratulations, and let me let you in on a little secret. I have no idea what's going to happen. This entire campaign has gotten wildly out of control. I thought the final boss was either going to be Warden Light or Lady Nim, and they killed one and they befriended the other. Theodora's evil. Everyone's unconscious or taken prisoner. It's real. It's gotten real wild. The wheels came off real fast there, folks. I don't know what to tell you. Maybe someday we'll do a season about a group of heroes who fight an unambiguously evil person and then they save the day by punching real hard.